put where I thought everything would go. But the problem was, at the same time, he was doing private parts. So we come in to do a test shoot. Howard comes in, and he looks, and he goes, I hate it. I go, you hate it? I've been working for six months, and what, what do you mean? What do you hate? He goes, your camera's in the wrong spot. They need to be back here. So I always just assumed that, you know, this is just going to be another one of those negotiations. But when he said it was going away, I still didn't believe it. I sort of was like, ah, he's really negotiating, you know. Um, but then as we heard more, and then Howard took us uh, at a little brief meeting with us after the show, that it seemed real. Hello and welcome to another edition of Here's the Pitch, and I'm gonna get right to the guest. This is very exciting. You've seen, of all the guys, I was really interested in you because you you didn't ca- you always came in with your opinions. You didn't care w- what people had to say. Um, tell me a little bit about that time walking into the to that to that studio, um, and not really giving a shit about throwing out your opinions, even though you know nine tenths of the people in that room didn't want to hear it and thought you were nuts. Yeah. Look, Howard was always great in that. He he let us. Uh, sort of just say what we wanted and there were no ramifications on, on that. Um, so in that way, you felt very at ease and able to, uh, you know, say what you wanted. Um, the ganging up was always ridiculous because I knew I was right on everything I was saying, but yet these peons would just jump in and jump in and <laughs> Jason would start typing notes to Howard, tell him this, tell him that. And, you know, it's it's frustrating at the end of the day, but at the same point, I I guess I enjoyed it because I would do the things to get me on the air to say it. So I would say something to Gary knowing that he's going to run the Howard and, and say it, and then I would be able to argue my point. Um, you know, and then also there were times like Al Franken and Michael Moore and being able to debate those guys was uh, was fun. I think yeah. I think you uh, in in life you won the Al Franken debate. Uh, if, if we look yeah. back, I think I win every of all the debates. <laughs> so a lot of the guys I would say you know didn't want to be in there, but did, you liked being in. You liked being called in. You liked especially if you had a point to make. Right? Some people didn't want to be in there because I don't particularly feel comfortable on air. But at the same point, as long as I'm arguing my point, I can sort of get over that. So when Howard would. There were a few times Howard was like, all right, Scott, we want you to come in for this segment. And I was like, oh, man, I, I, I really don't want to do it, you know. But when it was spontaneous and just going in to yell uh, my point, th- that was fine. I felt comfortable with that. Do, do you really have, like, a, a, a hatred of Jason, or is that more of a working relationship? Hatred is a very strong word. I just find the guy very annoying and... I don't see myself being friends with a person like that in, in real life. And what he did at the show literally was, you know, just trying to egg people, trying to throw them under the bus or, or you know, anyone's work. If there were a guy there who was like that, you would all hate him and you would take him out back and beat him up, you know. But uh, so, yeah. So in that way. He was very annoying, and and I'm sure it had a lot to do with politics, but I have so many liberal friends. It doesn't bother me, but he's just one who really, like, that little cackle and the smile he puts when when he makes his point, you just want to punch him, you know? (laughs) The kid in the back of the room, oh, that was Scott. Scott threw that at you, teacher. Yeah, exactly. He would totally tell, you know, in school, yeah. Scott, you directed the first E! show that... No, what had happened was I did camera work for the first uh, maybe two months and our director got sick. No, actually, our director wanted to leave and go back to L.A. He told another guy to do it, who was our engineer. He started doing it. It wasn't (laughs) very good. He got sick. They said, well, Scott, why don't you do it? So I did a great job, and then when he came back, they said we want Scott to keep doing it. <laughs> I, I I think through our conversations over uh, email, Scott, you know that I, I I'm a big TV guy. I used to work in the business, and I I'm always interested um, just in the behind the scenes stuff. And watching that show, first of all, it's five hours long, so you're you're you can't really take a break. You take breaks, obviously, obviously when he takes those long commercials. 
But you've got six people talking sometimes. And when it got bigger, you know, you get the serious. Now you've got Artie chair. You've got a Fred camera, a Benji camera. That's a lot to that's a lot to keep track of, especially with these what I would call demanding hours. I mean, a baseball game is three hours. You sit down, you do your three hours and, and, and it could go extra innings. But this thing and then you never know what's going to happen. Tell me a little bit about just the fun of it, because it is it, it is basically live to tape television. That was the hardest part is, you know, I sort of would know when to tone it down a little bit, sit on a shot of Howard and, and not kill myself. But then all of a sudden, three minutes into that, uh, it would become the segment. And then I felt like, well, I had missed some stuff behind you know, during the last three minutes. So thankfully, we had some ISO reels to, uh, to edit with. But yeah, figuring out when to turn it on, because I, I couldn't do five hours. I did that for the first... 10 years. And then finally I was like, Oh man. So I would, you know, start slowing down a little bit, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was fun. As the show grew, I kept adding cameras, adding pieces of equipment, adding graphics, adding, uh, li lighting elements. By the time, if you look at the show from K rock until we got the series there and you'll see just like the, the, uh, production value had changed a lot from, from monitors in the background to get some movement to moving lights and uh, robotic. Uh, we had a, a tracking camera that would fly around the ceiling. And, uh, you know, so, so I always was trying to push the show technically forward. Uh, although Howard wanted to sort of just see it minimal, um, you know, but it was fun. Stuff that would happen though is, is Howard's angle. And you've seen this change over years. You've even seen it change at his house like he's literally made it different when it started from his house. Tell me those, those things. Was it hard to uh, uh, to deal? Because I feel like he wants the microphone to cover up his whole face. I could go on for days about this subject. Um, well, go ahead. Say the, the first time <laughs> I heard anything about a good angle was during this film. So we had just uh, we were moving from 600 Madison to 40 West 57th Street. Design, uh, the, the radio guy had designed a studio and said, here's the furniture. How do you want it laid out? And I sort of put where I thought everything would go. But the problem was, at the same time, he was doing private parts. So we come in to do a test shoot. Howard comes in, and he looks, and he goes, I hate it. I go, you hate it? I've been working for six months, and what, what do you mean? What do you hate? He goes, your camera's in the wrong spot. They need to be back here. You just can't flip everything like that. So we literally took a month to figure it out what to do. We took a piece of furniture. Radio guy wasn't happy, engineer, because he had now had to rewire everything. We moved it to the other side, and now people couldn't get around that way. And so if you look, the first couple shows, maybe where Bush is in, the guest consoles on the left, uh, Howard's right, and then after that, we moved it over to the other side. Um, then Howard decided he had an exact angle that he wanted. It wasn't even just shoot the right side of his face. It was a three-quarter shot. So now I had to park two cameras on him instead of just having one like the old studio. You know, so now I'm a camera down on other stuff. And then we're adding people like Benji or Artie. And, and, and I'm, I'm trying to, so we're having to add more cameras. And, um, you know, it just became challenging. It, but then the worst part happened was he looked at a certain show. He thought he looked like crap. So I said, all right, let me look. And I, I looked at it. And I thought maybe the shadow was a little too much. Under, so I adjusted his lighting. He came back next year and he said, you've moved my cameras. And I said, Howard, I can't move the camera. It's literally bolted to the ceiling. I didn't, I swear, I would not move that camera. He goes, you move the camera. So now I go for another two weeks of trying to move the cameras, trying to move the lady, trying to make him happy. He's still not happy. So um, Scott Isaac at the time, he decides he's figured it out. And he wants to put his light literally like on top of his head so that his shadow goes over his Adam's apple and blocks that. And, and it, and I was like, oh my God, it looks horrible, but go ahead. We did it. Howard again hates it. So what I have to do is I've got to call another director up, another lighting guy, bring them in, 
put the cameras back to where I knew they had to be and where the lighting needed to be. The guys got there, showed up, and they and he had me park the video on a shot of Howard where he looked horrible before. And then he compared it to what he looked like from that day's show. And Howard said, I love it. You fixed it. Great. Walked out, everyone's happy, and I'm sitting there going, that was ridiculous. That, that <laughs> is so ridiculous. But that's what it took. We had to sell Howard that now he was all improved. I always watched it, and I thought, he's really just trying to cover his face with the microphone because it, it not your fault. It was a terrible shot. Some of these so shots that became the issue in the newest studio. He wanted, he literally wanted to block himself all the time. And I just found it to be, I, I couldn't do anything about it. I hated it. I, I, I was, you know, he wanted the shot really wide too. And uh, so it was wide, a mic blocking. He had all this stuff in front of him here and, and, I just threw up my hands and and we just did it. We gave him what he wanted, but I it's not how I would have done it. Now you're looking at Howard every day for 20 years. Do you notice the nose getting a little smaller, the chin, the maybe the hair? Is there anything with the hair? Tell us. You know, I honestly, if I had to bet and I had to get it right or I'd be dead, I would say yes. He's had hair and or nose. Well, he in fact he said he had a well, nose he talked about. about. But at the time, I, I had no idea, and I, I'm not good at that. <laughs> I, I didn't notice. There were times when you really enjoy it, and there were other times when you uh, thought it was awful, you know, and, and wanted to look for something else. But the majority of time, and as I look back, it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I, there were times when I was laughing so hard I couldn't, you know, I was crying, you know, just watching stuff. Like I always told John, stuttering John, the when he when he drank the orange juice and there were maggots in there, I mean, you know, I just I lost it. Um, and then a lot of the arty stuff, and you know, there were great friendships, and uh, it was a great twenty years. So I asked, all of them. And yeah, I asked Doug about this. I ask everybody who comes on. Do you would you have been a lifer? Do you think you'd still be working there if not? hearing the news while directing the show that you're not going to be working there anymore. And I want to ask about that, but would you still be there? You think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm not the type of guy that goes, uh, you know, leaves places. I just, I find my spot and I just keep going. So yeah, I, I think as long as that show were still happening, I, I would have been there. Yeah. And so there was these changes we see, we've seen this big summit meeting on YouTube. We've heard about it. Howard wants a list guest, and he's got this PowerPoint that he's put up in his crazy office what, what was it like just for you as as there was these changes? We all have heard of Marcy coming through. I don't know if she dealt with you guys as much, but what was it like for you? Honestly, it felt like the beginning of the end. Uh, it felt odd. It felt everything that the show was great for was being changed. And we all were sort of looking at each other, rolling our eyes, going... What the hell is happening? There's the part about the summit that I liked was that, that Howard was pushing for more guests. And there, there was a real attitude towards guests before that. It, you know, Gary would never look for guests and, and Howard would not want him to do that. And he used to always shock me. I'm like, hey, this guy's in town. This guy's in town. Why aren't we getting them on? But Howard just had this different take. If they want to come on, they know where to find us. And uh, so I enjoyed that part of that summit where Howard was saying, hey, we're going to go out and get the guests for once and have a, a, a actual booker for the show. Um, but it was the rest of the stuff that was odd. Yeah. What was what were those last days like uh, as you're watching Howard say, yeah, I have an idea. Um, we're going to get rid, rid of Howard TV, but I have an idea. What was it like? Because it, it happened on the air. He didn't tell anybody as usual. Yeah, I mean. We all were shocked. I first thing I did is I turned around and looked at Doug, and Doug sort of seemed dumbfounded too. I mean, so we had heard. Um, now I had been through probably five or six contract negotiations, whether it be radio or TV, along the way. So I always just assumed that you know this is just going to be another one of those negotiations. But when he said it was going away, I still didn't believe it. I sort of was like, ah, oh, he's really negotiating, you know. Um, but then as we heard more and then Howard 
took us uh, at a little brief meeting with us after the show that it seemed real. And I was uh, like, oh, this doesn't sound good. But I still hoped that someone would come in. I, I, I thought, he's doing the radio show. Why wouldn't he want the free money to do the television show? We didn't ask for any of anything of him. You know, he, he literally just had to do the show. And we would handle the television part. So I really thought it would come back. And um, it didn't. And I've heard other, I've heard various reasons for that. But um, who knows? They had our phone numbers. Um, they knew how to get in touch with us. I, I'm curious to this day why they didn't, whether it be, you know, I thought of everything. Was I too political? What did Howard, uh, was he not into the arguing anymore? Um, did Marcy think uh, we were bad for their culture there? I, you know, so did we get paid too much? I, I, I don't know. It, it could have been any reason, uh, but they never called. You know, they, they called for one thing to help. Uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, after we had just left, Gary asked uh, Doug and I to help with the, the birthday show that was coming up, Howard's big, what is it, 60th birthday party, I think. So we had been through those. Doug always ran the, the whole, practically, the, the guts of the behind the scenes of the show. So he and I went, and I went in, took a meeting in the city, and I told him, here's where you're going to want Howard, here's where you're going to want the stage, blah, blah, blah. I told him a bunch of stuff. Um, Doug then went and put all the finances together and said, all right, this is what it's going to take. Uh, then I hear from a camera guy who I know who talked to my wife and said, you know, Scott asked me to do the birthday show, but, uh, I've just been hired by another director. I was like, what? So we call up Gary and Gary was like, Oh, how'd you find out? Like, not sorry. I should have told you guys. I mean, we, we had taken these meetings and we budgeted the whole thing and we had worked on it. And, uh, it just felt like we're already down because we're looking for work now. I don't think Gary was going to go to bat for me anytime soon after the whole sleeping <laughs> video that Doug really was responsible for. <laughs> but I took the heat. I just watched that again to do, I do research here and the research is watching old clips on YouTube. And that is hilarious. I mean, just some of the stuff that goes on. Now, do you guys watch YouTube and look at some of these old things or is it, I did it. I don't care. I'm not that big a fan. I'm pissed off or whatever. I mean, you know, a lot of people, I'll be on the golf course. A lot of people ask me stern stories and I always come up with the same four or five stories. And I'm, I'm like, so every once in a while I'll look for something and watch something and it reminds me. Um, but no, I, I don't really do a lot of Howard Stern YouTube watching Doug. because, you know, ultimately I feel like that's partly why the show went away. You know, YouTube killed our job. Tell me, so these these times were Artie. I love Artie. I miss Artie. I ask everybody about Artie. But Scott, tell me about these times when you're watching him fall asleep or you're watching him fight Teddy or Sal. And I mean, did you have sense that there was issues with him or did you feel weird about showing this or was it, hey, it's a big party. Artie's laughing at it. It's fun. I literally had no idea he was doing drugs. Until after he would say it each time. Then I'd be like, oh. But then the next time I would give him the benefit of the doubt. And again, he must just be tired because he was up all night long. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, there became a time when the eyes start rolling into the back of his head sort of stuff. And the eyes, you know, the, the lids are like half open. And, you know, I had a camera on him. I felt like I had to do my job and capture it. But I felt guilty for it. Um and the extent that it was funny and he played along, like putting the bed out there so he could take a nap um, during the interview. Who, who was being interviewed when he's sleeping there? She's talking about her like, here's Artie just snoring on the on the bed. <laughs> it was so funny. But um, so the extent we can make fun of it, it was great. But um, ultimately it was sad. And Artie was a good friend and... Uh, generally the funniest person that worked in that whole 20 years of the show. Um, and I just hope he figures it out, you know, 
I'll kind of. call him once a year, maybe when I find a new phone number and we'll talk for a little while and then he disappears again. So two different eras. Jackie was more like there's a party in the studio and Artie was more like, um, you know, a, an SNL funny classic Dan Aykroyd bit. You know, it, it was it was just two totally different experiences. Uh, I would probably vote for the Artie era, but Jackie was damn close second. I mean, that that you know when Billy West was there and and just the howling and the and the laughing and the um the here's a weird dynamic. Jackie used to he would write uh, jokes and then put them into a bin that we had a camera up and then Howard would read it right. So whenever Howard said something anti Fred the first thing Fred would do is he would look over and look in the bin and see if Jackie wrote it. <laughs> and then he would attack Jackie. He wouldn't come back at Howard. He'd be like, well, Jackie's a drunk. <laughs> it was great. Are, are we listening to the show now? Do we care? Do we even, or is it too, too bitter? I, I'll, I'll listen to some of the interviews. That's about all that I 